So we will just recap with Louis XIV because everything begins and ends with Louis XIV. He is the Sun King. So, uh, so here we have uh, the fencing masters to, to the king. Um, Saint-Ange, uh, in things I've read, he has, has very favorable mention of, of his fencing. Uh, Rousseau, um, one of his descendants, kind of becomes important because he goes to the guillotine. And yeah, you have Pascal Rousseau and Jean Rousseau, um, you know, who was the, you know, master to the pages. Um, Besnard also publishes a treatise. There's Latouche again, um, Le Perch that we talked about, Le Bat, the Encore. They all have books that you can go and read. Um, when we go to Louis the Fifteenth, right? Um, some some of the things that are now happening in in the early 1700s with the corporation of masters, right? Uh, for a short time, uh, they changed the charter again to um, in the early 1700s to not allow Italians to come out of the academies of the king. And then eventually that part disappears later in, in the 1700s, but in the first part, they are deciding that they don't want the Italians uh, teaching in France. Probably because they got tired of the Italians saying, yeah, we taught you that. So, so, um, now, with the corporation, right, all of the, the academies, right, uh, where the masters have a degree from, you know, from the, the corporation of masters, right, they are known as the academies of the king. And there are a number of them, of course, throughout Paris and the, and the suburbs. Um, <clears throat> so here is, and You'll, and one thing you'll, you'll notice as we go through this, that um, clearly like all professions, if you are a fencing master at the noble court, that's a good gig. So if you have a son or a relative, it's certainly a gig you want to pass on to them, which happens a lot uh, during this time. Uh, so again, you have uh, Henri Francois Rousseau, um, as a professor, uh, Debris, he publishes a treatise. Um, Bremont, I only include him because he says he's a master of to the Musketeers. Love the title. Um, right, uh, Prevost, um, important down the line. Uh, Danay, Danay becomes important here um, coming up. Uh, Gerard publishes La Perche. Again, he published, um, I think right here, this is in reference to his, the younger Le Perch. Um, Telegory, and you see there are two, there's the uncle and then the younger. Um, Telegory ultimately takes over um, the academies of, of the king. Uh, we have O'Sullivan, he publishes, he was Irish. Um, La Boissiere, the elder, he publishes, and in fact, he and Danay um, have a bone of contention <clears throat> and uh, have some issues with, when, it, when it comes down to ultimately who's going to control the academies of the king and be the director of the corporation. Faldoni, Italian, he's a little bit later. And and so he, he's important if, uh, for a number of reasons. One in particular is that uh, Chauvet Saint George uh, does an assault with him at Foils, and Faldoni defeats Saint George. And this is when Saint George was a little bit older, and you know. But uh, Fa Faldoni defeats uh, the great Saint George. Um, 
Mote was the fencing master to um, Henry Angelo, who was Domenico Angelo's son, Domenico Angelo teaching in England. Uh, Martin, um, when things are looking rough in France, goes off and teaches in Russia and also writes a treatise. And then I have uh, Picard from Rouen in here only because, you know, Picard, you have to, you, you have to put him in there, make it so. Now, <clears throat> under Louis the Sixteenth, we have uh, Augustin Rousseau, which you saw three three others uh, from his family, right, being masters to the king and the pages. And here you have Augustin Rousseau being the fencing master, you know, to uh, Louis the Sixteenth's uh, sons, um, which you know, there become issues. So, uh, and uh, Francois-Louis uh, Prevost, again, um, that name becomes uh, more important in the 1800s. Uh, Jean d'Arissy, that last name should sound familiar because in, in the very first slide I was showing you that from the history of fencing was uh, his, his son, uh, Henri d'Arissy, and we have Gomard, uh, the elder here, who became provost under the elder La Boisseau. And finally, you have Louis the Seventeenth, or more commonly known as Louis Capet. <clears throat> so at at this point, right, um, he has. Uh, let's recap on the treatises that are published, then we'll talk more specifically about the history that's taking place through all of this. Um, so here's just, as I mentioned, all of the treatises that were published from you know, 1737 all the way up through 1818. And as all corporations and companies, there are political issues, right? There are problems with personalities. And as, as, as you, when you're looking at the last half of the 1700s, when, uh, who is going to be in charge of the corporation of masters and therefore setting the entire curriculum for the academies of the king. Uh, you have, um, you know, Domenico Angelo, of course, is being considered. Uh, Danae is pushing for the position uh, as, as well. And so and in 1766, Danae publishes his treatise. And one thing that Danae does is he changes the guard positions that, that have become established and just matter of fact within the French school. And Danae chooses to renumber the guards according to his new idea. And he lays this out. And this, this causes a good number of, of issues. And La Boisseur, definitely takes great offense and, and publishes. And in, in his treatise, he is critiquing um, Danae and says to the effect that, that why would you change what, what, what nature has made perfect already? So uh, La Boisseur does not have a lot of positive things to say about Danae in, 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 in his attempts to alter a, a structure that has been working for a, a rather long time now. All right, so now we have jumped forward. So uh, these, these images are from Domenico Angelo's work. 
And we're, this is the, you know, by mid late 18th century, right? This is when small sword has become refined. And you can see some similarities to the images uh, from Latouche earlier where their weight is on the back hip, right? Their arm, their weapon arms are a little more extended. Uh, the weapons themselves are a little bit shorter. They're more nimble. They're still working with the lunge. However, and here, um, you know, Latouche would refer to this as uh, the peri of Sacon with a descending point. But anyway, you have the Sacon hand position. You have the demi volt. Okay. But the, the lunge is not quite as deep as you see in the earlier treatises, right? It now becomes a little more conservative. And there is this emphasis on, on the weapon, since the weapon is lighter, uh, again, and, and they're emphasizing blade contact in the lighter play. There is this greater emphasis on, on elegance in the use of the weapon. So by the end of the 1700s, and, th and this is a very crucial point uh, in French fencing, is in essence, the end of the world as we know it, as far as the corporation of fencing masters is concerned, right? Um, you know, we mentioned that uh, Danet and La Brasseur have major disagreements on the approach to um, the teaching of, of fencing and the renumbering of positions. We have um, in 1788, uh, Danet, who was clearly vying for being director of the corporation, um, by, by 1788, uh, um, and just before that in the 1780s, whereas it was you know, the academies of, of the king, you, by the 1780s, you're, you, there are only three, uh, three academies left in, in that structure. And eventually Danet comes to power. And when he does, the, the academies of the king, they, they reform the charter and it becomes the Royal Academy with Danet as the director and Telegory, the younger, as the adjunct director. Now, what's interesting is a year later, um, you know, uh, once the, the Revolutionary Council, you know, takes over, the, um, the, the, the Corporation of Masters, they, they, they are losing their charter or their monopoly on teaching fencing. And so uh, <clears throat> a number of fencing masters goes before the National Assembly um, offering money and pledging their loyalty to the new formed government uh, at a request of uh, keeping their charter. And it's listed that Telegory is now the director when just a, a year before or less, if you look at the months, uh, Danae is listed as director. And then now Telegory is the director approaching the National uh, uh, Assembly. And of course, their response by 1791 is the Comité de Maître en Fait d'Arm de Paris, after 23 years, is disbanded, and they lose their charter. And then, just to rub it in, in 1792, uh, Danet's own school at the Rue de Chantre uh, closes down for good. So, <clears throat> from you know the mid 16th century. You have this monopoly in Paris of fencing masters who establish what is fencing and who may teach fencing. 
and it's required you graduate from, right, the, the academies of the king and test before their masters before you can open up a school in and around Paris. And now when they're closed down, this changes uh, fencing completely in France for the first time in exceptionally uh, a lengthy period. And I'll just make a note here, since you know we have the closing of the academies of the king, right? Uh, we have uh, Metra Telegory, who co you know comes out of that that company, taught Domenica Angelo and the Ch Chevalier Deon. Uh, Mote, as I mentioned before, uh, taught taught Henry An Angelo. Uh, La Boisseur, the elder, teaches uh, Fabian Saint George, and uh, the elder Gomard. And we have Darissi. Uh, we see uh, uh, La, La Foguerre. Jean Louis um, becomes a, pro a prominent figure in the 1800s, and Vigeon, which sh that name should strike a bell also. So I just wanted to point out that, you know, even at when the, the Royal Academy, as it was known in that moment, um, even though when it's, when it's closed down, you still have these people that, that are around even after this sense of there is a monopoly and a sense of controlling the standards of what is being taught um, that, that could be considered fencing, right? Prior to the fall of the Royal Academy, you have, right, if you attempted to teach in Paris and you were not authorized, you were considered a feral year or a, a, a junk merchant. And you could be arrested, fined, all of your stuff seized, your school closed down, all, all of those things. And that will bring us to our next segment of the 19th century.